When the moon hangs high in the midnight sky Like a cat's claw scratching down And the wolves, they do howl For they smell something foul Mr. Whiskers has come to town He trundles out of the dark Looking for a lark You better pray you don't catch his eye For when he is done having his fun You just might wish you could die <laughs> Good evening, kitties. It is I, your host, Mr. Whiskers, the Mad Catter, here with a special episode of Twisted Tea Time. See, I recently told James Hunter's tale, Mr. Fly Suit and the Mandela Effect, and due to the length, decided to divide it into two separate episodes. That, however, didn't sit right with me. It, it came out a bit sloppy, in my opinion, so I've decided to combine those two halves for your listening convenience here in what I shall consider to be the complete, the true, the right, the righteous episode 35 of Twisted Tea Time. Meow. For those just tuning in and wondering what the hell is he talking about, you might notice in your podcast feed a part A... And a part B, a a part one, and a part two. Well, ignore those. They mean nothing. If you have this episode, at least, this is the true season one, episode 35. Those other two are imposters. Do not trust them. (coughs) Moving on. Perhaps you have, perhaps you haven't heard of the Mandela Effect. A sort of collective misremembering of past events. The sort of thing one might chalk up to a forgetful mind, but one becomes quite suspicious of it when you find you're not the only person who remembers things a certain way. A wrong way. That you swear was the right way. Normally, I'd go a little more in-depth about the matter, but the story in question does a solid job of covering the basics of the Mandela Effect themselves, itself, something self. It's alive. So I present to you James Hunter's Mr. Mr. Flysuit and the Mandela Mandela Effect. Mr. Flysuit and the Mandela Effect by James Hunter There's this thing, a phenomenon really, called the Mandela Effect. This lady, Fiona Broom, coined the phrase back in 2010, and it's some batshit crazy stuff, let me tell you what. See... Fiona Broom swears up and down and sideways that Nelson Mandela died sometime back in the 1980s while imprisoned in South Africa. And she's not alone. She and a whole slew of other people claim to remember details about Mandela's funeral, including alleged CNN news coverage and even a scuffle over publishing rights involving Mandela's widow, Winnie. But here's the wonky thing. None of that happened. None of it. Zero. Mandela was freed from prison in February of 1990, went on to serve as president of South Africa from 94 to 99, and didn't pass away until 2013. So Miss Broom is wrong. They're all wrong. Every last one of the thousands of people who remember Mandela's prison death. Wrong, wrong, wrong. It's a fact. Yet these folks insist that it isn't. They insist Nelson Mandela died in the 1980s. They hold on to it like a religious creed, which is both fascinating and bizarre. And stranger still, more people are remembering this sequence of events all the time. It's like a disease spreading around the internet, infecting minds and memories. And thus, the Mandela Effect is born, or maybe discovered. 
Now, this would be weird enough, except there are other similar instances. Lots of them. There are loads of people who believe in the existence of a 1990s movie called Shazam, where Sinbad plays a genie. Except that doesn't exist either. There's no film footage, no studio invoices, and there's always a paper trail, no reviews, and Sinbad's gone on record stating unequivocally that it never happened. Period. The end. But it's not the end, because people still believe. Despite all evidence to the contrary, it happened. They can't seem to get the notion out of their collective heads. Then there's the Berenstain Bears, or is it Berenstain Bears, controversy. And Billy Graham's televised funeral, even though he's still alive in 2017. And what about Curious George? Tail or no tail? Or Jiff Peanut Butter versus Jiffy Peanut Butter? Hint, it's always and forever been Jiff. There's an enormous Reddit forum entirely dedicated to the Mandela Effect with more topics and more examples if you're interested in seeing the weirdness of the internet in all its glory. Now, some experts say the Mandela Effect is a mass delusion, a false memory somehow contracted by thousands of people all at once, a type of collective misremembering. But there are other theories, too. Some people claim the Mandela Effect is evidence of time travel. No joke. They believe someone from the future went back and altered the past, creating these odd little ripples in time. Maybe someone saved Mandela, causing the Berensteins to be replaced by their doppelgangers, the Berensteins, and poor Curious George ended up losing his tail. Shwick! Gone. It's the butterfly effect played out in the minutia of life. Just these little innocuous tweaks here and there. Maybe that's it. Maybe not. Miss Broom? Well, she claims the Mandela effect is a result of parallel universes. One slightly off kilter from our own, interacting rubbing shoulders while passing in the hallways of the cosmos, or maybe slamming together on a subatomic level. Personally, that's the way I lean. But what the hell do I know? I'm not an expert, I've never gone to college, and I work at a crappy security booth making minimum wage. Okay, so if I'm not some diploma-wielding expert, why do I bring all this up? I'll tell you why. Because I've experienced the Mandela Effect, too. It's not some big internet-breaking meme like the Berenstain Bears or Sinbad the Not Genie. It's smaller, more specific, more intimate. But if the fucking Mandela Effect is real, then this is it in spades. It has to be, because I don't know how else to explain it. My Mandela Effect has to do with the house on the end of North Cedar. And I know it's real because the place almost fucking killed me. And it did kill Jackie Morgan and Mark Lehman. That's a fact. Murdered them both. Though it all got blamed on a train accident. It wasn't a train accident, though. Not by a country mile. Okay. Okay, let's roll things back a skoosh. I grew up in Lusk, Wyoming. It's this little dirt speck town of maybe 1,500 people sandwiching the US-85 like two pieces of stale bread, rotting from age. It's the kind of place that hardly warrants map space. The kind of place people drive through. But only because they're heading somewhere better. Cleaner. Nicer. Lusk has lots of old brick buildings, remnants from a different era, run-down motels, shitty glass-fronted diners, and even shittier gas stations and truck stops. Every vehicle in town is liable to be a pickup, all of them old, rusted out, and, of course, American-made. 
It's a podunk town full of cow shit covered farmers, bored ass rednecks, and wrinkled skinned retirees. With all that said, there is one interesting thing about Lusk, and that's the house at the end of North Cedar, past Jefferson Street, all the way at the edge of the cemetery. It's an old, dilapidated American foursquare, perched on top of a small rise, snuggled back among a cluster of dark pines and leafy oaks. I can still see it perfectly in my head, just like an old photo. The sprawling front porch framed by squat square columns, the boards all worn and slightly warped, the white paint stained and peeling, dull windows running along the front, both upstairs and down, staring at the world like the menacing eyes of some giant spider. It had this kooky weather vane on top. An antique brass rooster riddled with green pockmarks jutting up like a giant middle finger to the world. That damned weather vane always stands out in my mind. Anyway, the place scared the absolute holy bejesus out of me as a kid. Me and my pals Jackie Morgan, Caroline Buckner, Mark Lehman, we called him Scooter, and Danny Carlisle. We'd go riding by it sometimes. We'd do it on a lark, just tear ass past, pedaling our bikes a million miles a fucking hour, sure that something would burst out from beneath the front porch. Either that or come barreling out the front door, jaws yawning wide, yellow claws raking at the air, ready to disembowel the lot of us. <laughs> I don't know why we thought that. No one lived there. The place was vacant and perpetually empty, and we'd never seen anyone go in or out. But the thoughts, the fear, persisted nonetheless. All that is to say, I remember the house in razor-sharp detail. And I remember what happened there back in June of 95. And it did happen. God's honest truth. It was the second week of summer break when we went in for the first time. And for the last, I suppose. We were having a sleepover, a camping trip, technically, at Caroline Buckner's place, which was off of 4th and Holly by the elementary school. It's weird thinking back to that. I mean, we were all 14, except Danny, who was 15, held back a year because he was a fucking retard. And we were still doing co-ed sleepovers. <laughs> That's the mid-90s for you, though. None of our parents cared about jack shit as long as there was a modicum of supervision, and technically Caroline's dad was there. In reality, Caroline's dad was a full-blown alcoholic who was a blackout drunk 95% of the day. So we were on our own. <laughs> we could have been running trains back there and that jackass wouldn't have noticed. I mean, we didn't, because Caroline was basically one of the guys, but we totally could have. What we did do, though, was steal a bottle of vodka. It's fuzzy in my head, but I'm pretty sure it was Crown Roos. We got shitty drunk around a big old campfire. The booze tasted like paint thinner mixed with nail polish remover, but I remember drinking the holy living crap out of it anyway. Burned my throat going down and left my eyes watering like I'd sliced a whole bag of onions. But I took slug after slug like a champ. All of us did. We stood around smoking stale reds, also stolen, bathing in a drifting cloud of blue-gray smoke while we cracked jokes and told ghost stories in the flickering firelight. Some of the stories were classic urban legend fare. The clown statue, Bloody Mary, the hook. Oldies but goodies, one and all. Scooter told a couple of stories from that book, scary stories to tell in the dark. I still remember Wonderful Sausage and The Red Dot. And Scooter was a hell of a storyteller. He had a real knack for it. Knew exactly how to pace things, how to hit all the cues just right and string you along like some gullible sucker at a used car lot. 
He did this thing where he'd drop his voice real low so you'd have to crane your neck to hear, and then BOOM! An explosion of noise or a clap of his hands, and suddenly you were on a one-way trip straight to Scare City. <laughs> but those stories were all bullshit, and we knew it. Even in the dark, alone, with the Wyoming wilderness at our backs, we weren't scared. Not really. Not until Jackie told us his story about the house at the end of Old Cedar. I've got a story, he said. His brown eyes downcast, his shoulders slumped, his mousy body curled in on itself while he smoked. He'd gone in. Not so long ago. Decided to check it out after he heard some seniors from Niobrara County talking about how there was all kinds of booze and cigarettes stockpiled in the basement like rations squirreled away for the fucking apocalypse. Loads and loads of old whiskey and homemade moonshine. Good stuff. Not like the swill we were drinking that night. So Jackie went... Broke in through the back door, then trekked down into the gloomy basement, all by his lonesome. But there hadn't been any liquor waiting for him down there. Nope. Instead, there'd been a hole in the wall, beneath the basement stairs by the water here. Inside that hole had been a man. Or maybe not a man. Jackie seemed undecided about that. He wore old rags, this creep. Layers and layers of heavily stained coats and dirt-caked jeans. He looked like the most down-and-out hobo Jackie had ever laid eyes on. And if that weren't enough weirdness, he wore pelts, too. All stitched together like a cape. Rabbit skins stained with old blood and gore. Bits of antler and yellowed bone attached with leather straps. His skin was ashy, Jackie said and withered like a worm left out in the sun. At first, Jackie had genuinely thought the guy was dead, laying in that hole in the wall, unmoving and stiff as an old board. But when Jackie backed away, making for the stairs like any rational human being would, the guy shot right up, his eyes wide, back arched, arms rigid. Jackie wasn't an idiot, so he didn't wait around to bullshit with the weirdo. Nope. <laughs> no way. He bolted for the stairs like an Olympic track star, legs pumping as fast as they could carry him. He was most of the way up when the pounding started. Thump, 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 thump. A pair of fists beating furiously against the underside of the wooden steps. When Jackie got to the top of the stairs, he faltered. Run, his mind clambered at him. Run and don't ever look back. But he did look back. It was a compulsion too strong to resist. A bit like watching an oncoming car accident. You know it's gonna be fucked, but you just can't seem to look away. Well, Jackie looked. Just a quick gander over one shoulder, and honestly, I can't blame him. How often have I slogged up the stairs late at night, but then paused to look back down to reassure myself some snarling beast isn't tearing after me? It's instinct. Nature. The man loaded down with pelts waited at the landing, one skeletal finger out thrust in accusation. Jackie lingered, fascinated and horrified in equal parts, his legs suddenly unwilling to cooperate or carry him any further. The man-thing canted his head to one side, roomy eyes squinting, and opened his mouth. At first there were no words, just this long building screech like a bag full of cats stuck in a cement mixer. Jackie's words, not mine. It was a sound no human could ever make. Still, Jackie stood transfixed, watching that screech. It built and built, rising in a terrible crescendo, slowly morphing into actual words. The words were a constant stream. Screamed from a thousand different voices all at once, each one slightly out of key with the other, but all coming from the same mouth. 
That awful racket, it seemed, finally broke the strange spell rooting Jackie in place. He turned, darted into the foyer, and right out the front door like hell was on his heels. Jackie shrugged when he finished telling us the story, and ran a trembling hand through his sandy blonde hair. He tried to play it cool, but he failed. He was scared, and we could all see it. Probably just some hobo hitching on the rails, he said after a time. That was possible. It wasn't unheard of for hobos to occasionally stop over in Lusk for a day or two since the Union Pacific Rail Line curved just north of the town and south of the cemetery. We all bobbed our heads in agreement, but we also edged closer to the fire because none of us believed it. The red dot might have been bullshit, but this was something different. We all felt it in the gut, I think. This was a real thing, a confirmation of something we'd always believed deep down. Sometimes I wonder if our belief is what opened the door to that hellhole in the first place. It doesn't really matter, I suppose. We were quiet for a while, smoking our cigarettes, passing around the cheap vodka, all the fun ghost stories discarded and done away with like spent party favors. Everyone was shaken, but okay. Right up until that moron, Danny Fucktard Carlisle, had to go and open his drunk idiot mouth. If anyone should have died in there, it should have been him. After all these years, I can still hear Danny's voice echoing around the campfire, his words slightly slurred and blurred on the edges. Holy shit, guys. Let's fucking go there. He swayed drunkenly on his leather shit kickers. I think Jackie's full of cow pies. His eyes are turning brown from all the horse shit he's spouting. So I say we call him out. Go over to that dump and march right down to the basement. And if there's some hobo... He sneered and grabbed his crotch in a fuck em gesture. No one wanted to go, of course. We all felt the weight of Jackie's story, the uneasiness of his words. But we were young, dumb, and full of calm, and even more importantly, we were full of cheap vodka. Way, way, way too much cheap vodka. Fucking crown roos. Besides, even though no one wanted to go, no one wanted to say so and be singled out as a pussy. Even Caroline, who legitimately had a pussy, didn't want to be slapped with that moniker. Shit. If anything, she was even more go-hung, eager to prove she was braver than any dick-swinging dude in our crew. So, like the teenage idiots we were, we went. None of us had a car, so instead we loaded up on our bicycles, a mix of treks, huffies, and vintage schwins, and peddled our drunk asses across town, sticking to the dusty back roads to avoid getting caught, and up to that godforsaken house at the end of North Cedar. It was dark as the heart of the ocean when we got there. The moon, a sickly thumbnail of silver hanging in the sky, was so obscured by rolling clouds it was as useless as tits on a helicopter. We had camping flashlights, though, Big old yellow sons of bitches that required batteries as big as a baseball to run. Danny was the first to turn his on, cutting through the deep cemetery gloom with the yellow beam. The house looked the same as it always did. Same boxy columns, same chipped paint, same dull windows. Except now, the front door was open, waiting for us. Just a crack, understand? Showcasing a thin crease of inky black. But it was fucking open. If there had been one brain cell between the whole lot of us, we would have turned back right that second and screw youthful pride right up its ass. But here's the thing about being young. You think you'll live forever. 
Everything's a joke and a dare because nothing bad can happen to a 14-year-old. Not anything really bad. Like death. Let's do this shit, Danny said, overflowing with false bravado. Cracking his knuckles like he was getting ready to wade into a fist fight instead of the mouth of hell. Yeah, I replied with a nod, trying not to sound like a colossal piece of chicken shit. Does, um, uh, that mean you're volunteering to go first? Scooter asked, his gaze shifting nervously between me and the barely open door. His question hung in the air. Every eye was fixed on me, expectant for my answer. You a pussy, dude? Those stares inquired. You all talk, or do you got the balls to back it up? Yeah, obviously. I replied with a sniff and an eye roll. It's just a shitty old house. And if there is some crackhead hobo... I paused, bent over and picked up a rusty piece of rebar laying on a pile of loose scree. I'll fucking show him what's what. With the rebar in one hand and my square flashlight in the other, I soldiered forward, leaving the others to trail behind me. I took a deep breath and trudged up the steps. The old wood bowed under my weight, letting out soft moans and groans as though the house were a living thing. I flashed the light across the windows, but the curtains... Dreary yellowing things were closed tight, obscuring the interior. I used the length of rebar to nudge the door open, sweeping my beam into the foyer. A fine layer of dust recently disturbed by the passage of feet, Jackie probably, covered the hardwood floors which were heavily scuffed and stained. Floral wallpaper bubbled, deeply cracked, and sporting more than a few splashes of graffiti decorated the walls. I inched into the room and swept my flashlight left. The beam washed over a boxy living room with the same tattered and peeling floral print. There was an old couch pushed up against the far wall, an ugly thing of faded orange and yellow fabric, which had to be from the 60s. Most of the cushions were slashed open, trailing white stuffing like gory ropes of intestine. There was also a stained mattress in the center of the floor, covered in empty beer bottles and old piss stains, which reeked like the inside of a hot porta john. The whole house smelled like that. Fucking gross. Further on, connecting to the living room, was a square dining space with a great big old table which lay in pieces on the floor, all its legs ripped off and scattered. Nothing that way, either. I paused for a moment, stealing a peek over one shoulder at my friends who were lined up on the porch behind me, clustered together looking small, pale, and frightened to their toes. Come on, I said. The stairs must be over that way. I jerked my head toward the right and moved deeper into the house. There was a kitchen up ahead, the floors covered in green linoleum, the few appliances that remained, a beat-to-shit gas stove and a drunkenly leaning fridge with the door hanging open, were so dusty I could tell they hadn't been used in ages. A lone chair, wooden and high-backed, sat in the middle of the room. There was a big staircase hugging the right wall shooting up like an arrow, but I didn't see the stairs leading down. There were two doors, though, situated between the kitchen and the staircase, and both were closed up nice and tight. I adjusted and readjusted my grip on the length of rebar, my palms slick and sweaty, and headed for the pair of doors. The floorboards squeaked and squealed as my friends followed, completely silent except for their footfalls and the sound of heavy breathing. I padded closer to the pair of doors, a creeping dread building in my stomach and clawing up my throat like a bout of nausea. I pushed it down, determined not to pussy out. Which door to pick was a coin toss, so I tucked the flashlight beneath my armpit and pulled open the one on the left, closest to the kitchen. 
I let out a ragged sigh of relief as my light splashed over the interior of a small bathroom with a chipped clawfoot tub, a porcelain sink, and a broken mirror, the jagged pieces carpeting the floor. One down, one to go. I scooted over to the next door, this time hesitating, my hand quivering on the knob. Sweat broke out across my forehead and my heart thumped like a jackhammer in my chest. More than anything in the world, I didn't want to open that door. I didn't want to go down into the basement and meet the hobo in the furs. What's the fucking hold up? Caroline taunted from behind. You lose your nerve, Mac? Maybe you need to grow a pair. Might be I have some I could lend you. She grabbed at her crotch. That earned a chorus of nervous, muted chuckles. I absently flipped her the bird in reply, steeled myself, and yanked open the door ready for a faceless monster to pounce. The door whooshed out. But there was no monster waiting. No man loitering at the foot of the stairs demanding that I let him in. I took the wooden steps slowly, descending into the dark as the hairs on the back of my neck stood stiff. There were spaces between each step and I couldn't help but envision a pale white hand shooting out and wrapping around my ankle, clamping down like a vice then dragging me away. But there was no hand or ankle grabbing, just like there'd been no murderous hobo. The basement was gloomy and dank, but no creepier than the rest of the fucked up house. Some old boxes, warped and moldy from the accumulated moisture, took up space against one wall, and copper tubing littered with spider webbing decorated the ceiling. There was a rusted, pot-bellied furnace, complete with an actual door for feeding in wood in the left corner. Metal ductwork poked up from the furnace like gnarled fingers disappearing into the ceiling. Beneath the stairs was the water heater, and just as Jackie had said, there was a jagged hole in the concrete next to it. An artificial cave, six feet high and four or five feet deep. Tucked inside was a pallet made of old blankets, but no bum. There was, however, liquor. A shit ton of bottles. Some plastic, others glass. Wine, whiskey, vodka, schnapps, good stuff too. Though no smokes. Holy shit, Danny said, spotting the treasure trove. We hit the motherfucking pay dirt here. The others whooped and hollered, clapping each other on the shoulders in congratulations. The fear banished, replaced by adrenaline and greed. Jackie didn't look relieved, though. He looked even more anxious. Well, let's get the real party started, Scooter said, shoving past me and into the hole, pulling free a bottle of Goldschlager. He held it up, giving it a swirl the flecks of gold dancing and weaving in the beam of my flashlight. We'd been drinking for maybe an hour when we heard the clunk, clunk, clang of something scraping and rooting around. It sounded like an animal. A big one. Everyone fell deathly silent, eyes going wide and wild as the sound came again. Clunk, clunk, clang. Louder this time. In the quiet, it wasn't hard to tell where the noise was coming from. The pot-bellied furnace in the corner. Everyone scrambled to their feet, beating a hasty retreat for the stairs as the sound grew louder and more persistent. Jackie was the first one up the stairs, his shoes thudding on the wood, followed by Caroline, Scooter, Danny, and me bringing up the rear. Everyone froze, though, as the handle on the furnace firewood hatch screeched open, and the metal door swung outward with a rusty groan. My hands trembled, flashlight wavering, rebar twitching, as I stared at a square of pitched black, hardly large enough to accommodate a small child, 
in the center of the furnace. There was nothing there, though, and for a second I almost chalked it up to coincidence. Maybe some sort of critter had gotten in, like a possum or a large squirrel, but then a pallid face, completely bald, maggot white, and deeply creased like old boot leather, appeared in the opening. A crude set of symbols were carved across its forehead, the wound still red and puffy. After all these years, I can still see that damned symbol clear as day, like it's tattooed on my brain or something. The breath caught in my throat, and I thought I might vomit as the thing stared at me with milky pink eyes. I would have said it was blind. How could it not be? Then it winked at me, as though reading my thoughts, and offered me a sly, lopsided smile. Its pencil-thin lips pulled back, revealing a mouth full of nubby black teeth like pieces of broken glass. A tongue, chalky and white, slipped free, running around the edges of its too wide mouth. Then, the creature, and I was sure as shit it was a creature and not a man, pulled itself from the furnace in herky, jerky motions of a bad stop-motion animation. Spidery hands tipped with dirt-caked nails came first, attached to overlong arms as it wriggled and wormed its torso free. Its arms were bulky as though it were wearing jacket after jacket, but it didn't take long to notice the coats were moving, shifting. I gagged. Not coats, though that was an easy mistake to make at a glance. Flies. Millions of black-bodied things. And over the top of those were the pelts, rough-cut garments crudely stitched together into a tattered cloak of fluttering trophies. There were patches of pale pink flesh, almost like dried, uncured pigskin woven into that grotesque mantle. One piece of leather, a little larger than my palm, had a faded tattoo on it. A pair of praying hands with a rosary looped around them like a noose. Holy fucking McFuckerson! Danny screamed from behind me, grabbing my shirt with a meaty palm and pulling me on. His words, bristling with unapologetic terror, seemed to jar everyone to frantic motion, and we all broke like a herd of stampeding cows. Unlike Jackie, I didn't pause when I reached the top. I didn't need to, because I could hear that thing scrambling and skittering over the concrete floor, drawing ever closer. I knew it hadn't made it to the stairs yet, but I could almost feel it reaching for me, its hot, fetid breath brushing up against the nape of my neck. I darted through the entry. Danny promptly slammed the door shut behind me with a booming thunderclap. Get the fuck out of the way! Carolyn hollered, sprinting towards us with a lone chair from the kitchen. I shuffled back, head reeling from what I'd just witnessed as she crammed the chair up beneath the doorknob, and not a moment too soon. The second she had it wedged firmly in place, the door handle rattled and shook, followed by a fist slamming against the wood. Thunk! 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 I stared at the door, trapped and immobilized. Then, the creature shrieked. An inhuman noise like a buzzsaw cutting into a piece of sheet metal. Let's go! Danny said, tugging on my shoulder. I didn't need much prompting. I wheeled around and beelined for the front door, except Scooter was already there, desperately turning the knob, trying to pry the door open. It didn't budge. Not an inch. The windows, I said, my voice oddly calm and detached. Bust them out. Jackie was moving before the words were even out of my mouth, sprinting toward the windows in the living room. He threw back the musty yellow curtains, but faltered, confusion and fear dashing across his face in turns. It was easy to understand why. 
Instead of cloudy glass staring out on the forlorn graveyard, it was simply a sheet of implacable wallpaper, smooth and seamless as though no windows had ever existed there. Caroline tried the windows near the stairwell leading to the second floor. More of the same. Just blank walls covered in that gaudy floral print. Another crash from the basement doorway drew my eye. The creature was still shrieking its let-me-in him, but now it was working over the door like a boxer going to town on the heavy bag. The door rattled in its frame, the wood bowing and splintering with each successive blow. Back door and kitchen windows, I yelled at Jackie. Check them all, everyone else? I paused, glancing around, wild-eyed. Weapons! Find a weapon! Anything you can defend yourself with! Everyone scattered, most heading for the living and dining rooms, while I made for the basement door. Since I already had a weapon, and a decent one, I planted myself in front of the basement door, flashlight trained on the cracking wood, rebar raised and ready to go. It's the same back here! Jackie called out, scampering out of the kitchen, pitted butcher knife clutched in one white-knuckled fist. Door won't budge, and there aren't any windows! He spun in a slow circle like an animal trapped in a cage. What are we gonna do, Mac? What the fuck are we gonna do? I shook my head because I didn't have an answer. The others appeared a few seconds later, clutching an assortment of wooden table legs from the dining room and busted beer bottles from the piss-stained mattress in the living room. All right, back door's fucked too, I said, never taking my eyes off the basement stairwell. Only way left to go is up. Are you fucking high? Danny hissed. Why would we go up? There's five of us, one of him, and we got weapons. Let's bust this summer bitch up. Shut the fuck up, Danny! I yelled, rounding on him. That thing isn't human, you fucktard. It's a monster. A demon or some shit, I don't know. And you don't even get to say because you're the only reason we're here. Let's fucking go there. Jackie's full of cow pies. This is your fault, jackass. Now shut your mouth and get upstairs. Maybe the windows will work up there, and if not, well, maybe there's a way we can get to the roof. Jackie and Caroline went without hesitation, but Danny and Scooter lingered, heading over to the living room, preparing to take a stand. Don't be morons, I said, backtracking for the staircase, happy as a pig in shit to get away from that screeching, Let me in! Let me in! Let me in! Let me in! Playing on repeat like a broken record. I was a few feet from the staircase when the basement door exploded outward, chunks of wood flipping through the air like shrapnel. The thing from the basement didn't waste a second. No, it scuttled out on all fours like an overgrown, human-faced fly. <laughs> Mr. Flysuit, I thought deliriously. Let's get this fucker! Danny screamed, charging in, a broken table leg upraised like a medieval mace while his flashlight beam bobbed and weaved. Scooter was a step behind. I rounded the stairs, but had to stop. Had to. And watch. I honestly can't say why. Mr. Flysuit was skinny, even with the layers of shifting flies carpeting its body. But it moved like a snake and hit like a Mack truck. Danny lashed out with his club a wild swing which sailed clear over the creature's head. The demon shot inside his guard and blasted him in the chest with a closed fist, lifting Danny into the air and flipping him ass over tea kettle. He crashed in a heap not far off, limbs splayed out and eyes hazy from shock. I hesitated, eyeing the stairs, then Danny, the stairs, then Danny. Finally, I rushed over, helping the moron to his feet. Glancing up in time to see Scooter lunge forward, thrusting a broken bottle toward the thing's face. Flysuit batted aside the attack with lazy ease, then leaped like a pit bull, nails slashing into Scooter's throat, drawing a deep line of red across the skin. Scooter dropped the bottle and staggered back, clutching his ruined neck. Mouth wide as blood leaked between his fingers. Fly suit wasn't done. 
It tackled Scooter around the middle, driving a shoulder into his gut, bringing him to the ground. I tore my eyes away. There was nothing we could do here, not for Scooter, maybe not for ourselves. Instead, I turned and dragged Danny up the stairs, pursued by that gut-wrenching sound of Mr. Flysuit chewing and slurping. There was another door at the top of the stairs, but Jackie and Caroline were gone, vanished. Danny and I shoved our way through, leaving Scooter to die, guilt riding my back like a monkey. The door shut, and darkness enveloped us, save for the meager illumination our flashlights provided. But there wasn't anything for our flashlights to illuminate. The room, if it was really a room, seemed to stretch on forever with no walls and no visible end. It was an impossibly big space, and there was no way to tell where we were or where we needed to go. There was no sign of Caroline or Jackie either. Danny and I were lost in an ocean in the dead of night without any idea where the shore lay. Where the fuck are we? Danny asked in a harsh whisper, sweeping his light fruitlessly from left to right. Where the fuck are we? He said again, this time more to himself than to me. I turned around, searching behind me for the door. I found the wall easily enough, covered in the same awful floral print as below, stretching off in either direction for as far as I could see. But there was no door. I turned again, pressing my back firmly against the wall, and shouted, Jackie! 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 I paused as my voice echoed and bounced, oddly distorted. Caroline! Caroline! After a few long moments, Caroline answered, We're here, near the door. Her voice sounded faded, weak, and impossible to pinpoint. It felt like hearing someone shout while underwater. Follow the wall, Jackie called. But watch out for the... His words guttered and died, as though the house had silenced him before he could spoil whatever surprise it had in store for us. Jackie? Caroline? Danny hollered, a hand cupped around his mouth. This time there was no answer, just crushing, terrible silence and all-pervading darkness. Come on, I said, nudging Danny in his meaty shoulder. I turned right and walked, trailing the length of rebar along the wall as I scanned the featureless room for any sign of Jackie, Caroline, or an exit. Danny walked behind me, checking our back trail every few steps to make sure the freak from the basement wasn't tagging along behind us. I didn't see anything, but I felt eyes on my back the whole while, as if someone, or lots of someones, were watching us from outside the range of my flashlight. We walked for a long time, ten minutes maybe, when my light finally flashed over something up ahead. A corner with another long wall angling off to the left. Instead of celebrating at the find, though, I skittered to a stop. Danny ran into me from behind. What the fuck? He started. His words cut short as his gaze landed on the boy standing ahead, head bowed, facing the corner like a toddler in time out. He was a dusky-skinned black kid, maybe five, in thoroughly stained blue pajamas. The cuffs were ripped and frayed. I crept away on silent feet, driven by instinct, but stopped again when I heard the rustle of movement coming from behind me. The noise was faint, barely there at all. The scuttle and scrape of nails on the floor and the distant droning of flies. The kid in the corner seemed to hear the sound, too, and turned his head towards us, the rest of his body stiff and unmoving. A scream built in my chest, but caught in my throat like a piece of popcorn. All that came out was a weak, hollow squeak. The boy had no face. 
It was like someone had used a giant ice cream scoop to hollow out his entire skull, leaving only a sliver of chin and an edge of forehead as a reminder of what had once been. There was no blood, gore, or bone, though, and no strings of gray brain matter. No, just a hollow cavity filled with inky shadow. The little kid lifted a finger, placing it where his mouth should have been. Shh, he hissed, despite not having a mouth. He comes. The scuttling intensified, the scritch, scratch, scritch, drawing closer as the buzzing built. And all will be punished. Then, the little boy simply turned back to the wall, resuming his self-imposed time out. Fuck this shit, Danny said, shaking his head like he refused to believe his eyes. We gotta go, Mac. We gotta go. He spun, not waiting for me to reply, and bolted away from the wall, running headlong into the darkness and not caring. Anything to get away from that creepy-ass kid without a face. I hesitated for only a heartbeat before taking off too, training my flashlight on Danny as we ran. This was dumb, I knew. We should have tried to skirt around the boy and follow the wall, but... I couldn't stomach the thought of being stuck in here alone. I saw nothing as I ran. Just choking blackness and scuffed hardwood floors underfoot. But I heard the constant scritch, scratch, scritch of nails on wood the whole way. Eventually, a wooden door, the frame covered in jagged green script pulsing with cancerous light, materialized out of the dark. Aside from the strange runes running along the frame, the door looked identical to the one we entered the room through. Except there were no walls around it. It stood free and unsupported like an ancient Egyptian obelisk. I slowed my mad dash, and circled it slowly, carefully, running my fingers over the surface as I walked. It vibrated subtly beneath my digits, but didn't seem to lead anywhere. How could it? When I tried the knob, though, it turned easily in my hand, swinging open, spilling a pool of dirty purple light across the floor. What the fuck is this place, I thought, before hustling through, eager to leave the black room behind. The odd door deposited Danny and me in a new room. Except it wasn't a room at all. It was a fucking forest is what it was. The ground a sea of lush green grass. The landscape peppered by towering oaks, old-growth pines, and broad-leafed sycamores. And like everything else in this place, the forest wasn't natural. The trees were wrong, for one. The leaves and pine needles were all varying shades of red. The tree trunks were twisted things that looked like human bodies, but distorted and broken, with faces protruding out, each permanently locked in a rictus of suffering. High above, a bloated purple moon hung in a cloudless sky like a rotten plum. Strangest of all, though, were the doors. More freestanding doors haphazardly strewn among the trees. Each door was nearly identical. Thick wood, scrolling runes, and a square window in the center. But each peered out on a different destination. I saw a few towns, podunk places not so different from Lusk and a handful of big cities with yawning skyscrapers of steel and glass. But there were other places, too. Fantastical, impossible places where the air burned, where islands floated unsupported in the sky, where creatures made of discarded branches, rotten vines, sludgy mud, and bits of bone milled about in deep shadow. None of those doors were ours. I knew they might open for others, but not for us. There was only one door for us. One door which would lead back to Lusk, and that was the one we needed to find. Let's go, I said to Danny. We need to find Jackie and Caroline if we can. 
Either that or the way out. If there is a way out, I've finished weekly. Yeah, he mumbled softly, wheeling about, eyes wide as saucers. We walked, walked for so long, I lost track of time. I was on the verge of giving up, sitting down, leaning back against one of the distorted body trees and closing my eyes for a while, when Danny gave out a hoot of joy, pumping a fist in the air. Jackie and Caroline emerged from a thick cluster of pines not far ahead, stumbling around drunkenly, their faces pale, their movements languid. Even at a glance, I could tell they were exhausted to the bone. But they looked up at the sound of Danny's cry, huge smiles breaking across their faces, almost in unison. Those smiles slipped, though falling by the wayside as they caught sight of something behind us. A creeping dread spread through me like a fever, and I was suddenly sure the man with flies was behind us, silently creeping through the grass on all fours, ready to pounce, to maim, to kill. A cold sweat broke out along my forehead and trickled down my back. I clenched down on the spit of rebar and spun, lips pulled back in a snarl. Instead of the Mr. Flysuit, though, was the front door to the house at the end of North Cedar Point. And not just the door, the whole foyer. The floral-clad walls grew right up out of the ground as if they were a natural part of the landscape, except now a single phrase was gouged into the drywall over and over again. Let me out! The ragged edges of the lettering, combined with smears of dried brown, made me think those markings had been made by hand, carved out with desperate, bloody fingers. I glanced down and noticed the floorboards were back too, blending and bleeding seamlessly into the grass behind me. It was impossible to pinpoint where one ended and the other began. We... we should never have come here, Jackie said, his normally mousy voice certain and somber. This is my fault. I knew it wasn't a hobo, but I told the story anyway. I started this. He clenched his jaw tight and marched forward, slipping between Danny and me right up to the door. He extended a hand and hesitated just inches from the knob, unsure. Thinking back, it's almost like he knew what was coming, even though that's impossible. He nodded his head then, as if accepting his fate, and clasped the knob, giving it a sharp turn. This time, the door swung inward with a squeal, revealing the grassy rise in the cemetery beyond. Flysuit was also standing there, crouched low to the ground, its lips pulled back, revealing its broken glass teeth. It shot forward, jabbing its talon-tipped fingers into Jackie's gut, plunging in and out over and over again like a pair of meaty pistons. Jackie stumbled back, dropping his table-leg club, groping at his stomach while frothy crimson gurgled between his lips. His heel caught on a rock protruding from the ground, and he went down like a load of bricks. Flysuit attacked like a shark with a nose full of blood, scrambling onto Jackie, driving its bony knees into his ruined gut, clamping its jaws around his throat while flies poured into Jackie's open mouth. Their writhing bodies choking off his cries. Caroline, Danny, and I had two options at that moment. Attack the thing murdering our friend, or run. Fight or flight, distilled down to its most basic form. Danny chose first, shoving past me as he lumbered for the door, terror in his eyes and Jackie already forgotten. I wish I could say I'd done something different, that I'd been braver, better. I wasn't. I hooked an arm around Caroline, frozen in place with indecision, and bolted. I glanced back one last time as I'd cleared the front porch. And though it's hard to be certain, 
I could have sworn Flysuit loitered in the doorway, and behind him was a new sapling sprouting up from the center of Jackie's sunken chest. I don't remember how we got back to Caroline's. None of us did. We all woke up the next morning as the sun crept up over the horizon, shooting golden fingers into the pale blue sky. It almost felt like everything from the night before had just been a terrible nightmare, brought on by a combination of too much alcohol and too many cheesy campfire stories. Except we were two people short. Scooter and Jackie were gone. Their bikes nowhere to be seen. A farmer, a fellow by the name of Leslie Hawthorne from Manville, found their bodies later that day over by the tracks, hit by a freight train, then picked over by a pack of coyotes. Okay, there it is, the story I haven't told a soul, not in twenty years. Now let's get back to the present and back to the Mandela effect. So a couple months ago, I returned to Lusk for my 20-year high school reunion. I didn't go back for the 10-year because I couldn't force myself to see that place again, not after what had happened. Couldn't stand to look my parents in the eye, to drive down the 85, or talk with the old crew, since Jackie Morgan and Mark Lehman, obviously. I just couldn't do it. I didn't want the nightmares to come back. But after 20 years, after 20 years, well, I just threw up my hands and said, fuck it, and fuck it all. The town was more modern than I remembered, but only just. Mostly it was the same shitty brick buildings, the same glass-fronted diners, a few had different names at least, and the same sagging faces, even more tired and worn down by the years. Honestly, the place looked like it had one foot in the grave. One stiff breeze might have blown everything over and wiped the whole place right off the map, good and proper. That probably wouldn't be a bad thing. Still, there was some part of me that felt good being there. Going back was this cathartic experience, like I was finally ready to move past everything. To really put it behind me. Naturally, the first thing I did was putter on up to the house at the end of North Cedar in my Camry. The tires bawled, the suspension shot, the front window cracked, a huge dent in the front fender. I headed north on 85 South Cedar Street in town, cruising past a mom-and-pop drugstore and the Herald newspaper building, then over the train tracks on the edge of the town proper. I veered left onto North Main Street, a two-lane cut of asphalt with a squat white plaster propane shop on the right, and headed straight for another 200 feet, which saw me through the stone cemetery gates. I idled past the swath of green grass studded with tombstones like blunt gray teeth, and into the pine trees on the far side. It didn't take long for me to find the rise at the end of North Cedar. The one where the house should have been, but wasn't. I killed the car, unbuckled my seatbelt, and slid out. I frowned, fished a pack of reds from my pocket, and lit up a smoke as I leaned against the hood of my car. I stood there for a good half hour, chain smoking cigarette after cigarette, my arms folded across my sunken chest, Nicotine flooding my system as I stared at the unassuming plot of land. There was an old concrete slab there, pitted and chipped, a foundation. Like maybe someone, years and years ago, had thought about building something out here, but finally decided against it. You can see this slab on Google Maps if you're inclined to check. 42.773047, negative 104.452130. But there wasn't any sign of the house, 
No sign of the basement, either. It had been twenty years. So my assumption was someone had just leveled the damn place and backfilled the basement with concrete. Except that's not what happened. It was the fucking Mandela effect. See, I climbed into my car and headed back into town, stopping at this cozy hole in the wall for lunch. I ordered a greasy burger and made idle small talk with a tired-looking waitress with a wave of chestnut hair going gray at the temples and deep bags under her eyes. Eventually, I asked her about the house at the end of North Cedar, the one past Jefferson Street by the cemetery. She'd been in Lusk almost as long as I'd been away, but she'd never heard of the place. Not a once. Not even as part of some scary local urban legend. I smiled, thanked her, and finished my meal in peace. After that, I made a pit stop at a gas station, asking a pudgy kid of maybe 19 about the house. Same question, same answer. The Herald newspaper was open, so I stopped there next. James Mackerson, a beanpole with a basset hound face who'd run the Herald even when I'd been a kid, was tooling around the office. The guy had to be in his early seventies, but he was still working hard, and looked pretty damn spry for such an old fella. He didn't remember me, not that I offered him my name, but even more disconcerting, he didn't remember the house. He insisted no such place had ever existed. Just that stone pad, laid out in the 1940s by a pair of brothers named the McLeans. No one remembered. No one except Caroline Buckner. Jackie and Scooter were dead, and Danny was long gone, in prison from what I could find. But Caroline was at the reunion. She hadn't aged well. Her body had gone soft and flabby, her hair prematurely gray. Not that I was in a position to cast stones. I looked like a giant bag full of soggy dicks. Still, I knew it was her in an instant. I could tell by her steely blue eyes and the lines of her jaw. And one look at her told me all I needed to know. She remembered all right. The way she tensed up when she saw me... The wild, panicked look in her gaze, followed by a wave of guilt sprinting across her features. I didn't need to ask, because the memories were carved into her flesh like old scars. I did ask, though, because I'd come from Milwaukee for this, and I needed to be sure. Needed it more than I've ever needed anything else. A conversation was brief. Neither of us could stomach talking about what happened in the house, I think. But she remembered. And maybe even more importantly, she also gave me a few names. People like us who knew about the house, too. Brian Wilkerson. This guy a couple years older than us who went to Niobrara County High. Jamie Burakoff. A soccer mom from Manville who dated this high school buddy of mine, Chad Jenkins. Not a lot of people but enough people to reinforce that I wasn't batshit bonkers. <laughs> Motherfucking Mandela effect. Am I right? I mean, I know that place is real. I'm not crazy. And Mr. Flysuit? I know he's real too. Know it as sure as I know the sky is blue. Him I still see. Not always. Not even often. But sometimes, in a pocket of deep shadow, or as a blur just out of the corner of my eye, sometimes there's a flash of him in my mirror or in my computer screen late at night. I see his face, distorted and indistinct, mouthing the words, Let me in, let me in, let me in. He's already got his hooks into me. Not enough to break through from wherever he lives, but enough for me to get a glimpse of him whenever our universes rub shoulders from time to time. 
I wonder sometimes if there are others like me out there. Other people with their own versions of the house at the end of North Cedar. Haunted places that don't exist, not in this version of reality anyway, but maybe in some other place and time, in some other world, remembered only by a few. There's gotta be, right? There were a shitload of doors in that weird forest, and all of those trees twisted and oddly human? Had those all been people once, like Jackie? When I say it out loud, it sounds crazy as fuck, totally impossible. If thousands of people remember Mandela dying. However, even though that never happened, then why not this? But then I think this is probably all just a bunch of bullshit. A terrible half-remembered nightmare I concocted to make sense of losing two friends. Probably Jackie and Scooter did get hit by a train while drunk. Maybe the coyotes picked over their bodies. Maybe. Some part of me hopes so. Because the other alternative is too fucking scary to get my head around. And probably not for the reason you're thinking. Sure, what happened was traumatizing as shit, that goes without saying, but what I'm really worried about is that someday down the road he might come back for me. Because here's the thing, it seems that once the Mandela effect takes root in the collective hive mind of humanity, more and more people begin to remember. It's like catching a mental cold. A virus passed on through belief, imagination, and memory. And the more people who remember, who believe, the more real it becomes. And maybe that's not such a big deal with the little things, like Shazam or Curious George's Tale. But what about the monster that lived in the house at the end of North Cedar Street? Will that collective belief spawn more houses and more windows for Mr. Flysuit to gaze through? And if it does, how long before someone slips up and lets him through for good? How long before he finds a way to let himself into my home for good? Or into yours? Welcome back, kitties. I dare say, not to lessen the trauma of Mac and the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day, but all of this sounds rather familiar, don't you think? Let's see. I can place this. A group of kids, one girl and a bunch of boys, uh, the girl being kind of tomboyish, in some small, inconsequential American town, chase down a dark rumor legend 
thing, eventually descending into the lair of a horrible monster where they confront it, and well, at the end of the day, at least a few survive. Now, where have I heard that story before? I could have sworn it was a big movie or book or miniseries or something. Oh, that reminds me. You should all go see it. I hear it's amazingly terrific film. Fun for the whole family. It even has a clown. And who doesn't like clowns? Oh. Oh, wait, sorry, I had that mixed up a bit. I mean, it's a terrifying film, and it's rated R, so probably not good for the wee ones. And, um, oh, and apparently fear of clowns is a very widespread and almost, um, well, almost pathetic, really. But, oh, okay, all right, well, anyways, fear of clowns is a thing. Uh, oh, well, just, just go see it and support rated R horror films on the big screen. Ah, we gotta show Hollywood that that's an actual money maker. No, no more of this PG-13 crap. Now, what was I talking about? Oh, yes, I was trying to think of a movie that had a similar overgeneralized plot structure to the story I just told. Hmm. Ah, well, it'll come to me later. Ah, all right, there was one more thing on today's lessons, on today's show. Um... Well, no shout-outs today, I guess. I, I guess no one loves me. I mean, I'm just a boogeyman cat thing, an abstract entity of chaos that just wants to tell scary stories and <laughs> feed on the collective fear of humanity. Don't I deserve some love? Don't I deserve someone for me? Maybe. Maybe that's the thing. It, it's the modern age. And, and love is such a strong word for, for this internet generation. No one has time for that sort of commitment. Yeah, that's it. So fuck love. Have a debaucherous fling with me and slip on over to Stitcher or iTunes and leave me a five-star rating. And hell, if you're really naughty, go ahead and leave me a review as well. Yes, you are naughty, aren't you? Yes, you are. I know it. It's okay. We're all understanding, yeah. Still, there, there was something else on the agenda. Aha! Hear that music? That means it must be time for the podcast, podcast shout out. This episode's podcast shout out Edict Zero F I S. This science fiction audio drama series is easily one of the best produced pieces of audio fiction I've had the pleasure of hearing. It features amazing writing, voice acting, a plot packed full of cyberpunk action and intrigue, as well as wonderful music and sound effects. Uh, here, just let me read the story section from the website itself. That, that'll, that'll summarize it a little bit better than I can here. Oh, and I'll, I'll, I'll let my host body do it. I think he can get the voice, uh, a better voice for it. <clears throat> One moment. Me, 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 me. Edict Zero was its original name. A code name assigned to a destination planet and the mission to reach it. New Earth, like Old Earth, is a planet of mostly water, but with even less land. It is a small world of five islands, each island a state in the Federation, the democratic entity otherwise known as Edict II, which governs the bulk of humanity. Under the broad authority of its Attorney General, the Civilian Law Enforcement Utility Edict III is a cluster of collaborating agencies such as the FIS, an initialism for Federal Investigative Services. 
Like other agencies in Edict 3, the structure of the FIS is an amalgam of the old Earth law enforcement agency models deemed most effective by historians and E2's founding fathers. In response to the cataclysmic events on New Year's Day of the year 2415, the FIS assembled a task force at their headquarters in Capital City to find the responsible party, eliminate the danger posed to the public, and deliver justice for the victims. In acknowledgement of the severity of the threat and the accordingly devastating consequences which could arise from the slightest oversight, Assistant Director Alan Dockstadter authorized a special unit of the task force to pursue unusual leads and the alternate outside-the-box theories those leads may support. Edict Zero FIS focuses on this small team of special agents and their investigations, which will put them at odds with the highest authority of humankind. Edict One, whose secrets are getting harder to keep. Each episode is an hour and change of science fiction audio goodness. With such a high production value, if, if you listen with your eyes closed, you'll think there's a movie on. And if you listen with headphones and then close your eyes, well, we're not responsible for the side effects that level of immersion might have. So find your notes so Socrates can know what to call you and go on down to edictzero.wordpress.com or onto iTunes or Stitcher Radio or wherever else they have their podcast posted and treat yourself to some exquisite science fiction storytelling. Now, alas, my friends, the time has come. I do believe this story is done. I am afraid that I must fly, so... Oh! One more thing before goodbye. We're fast approaching October, which means we're about to hit the one-year anniversary of Twisted Tea Time. I have plans for next year. Such glorious plans. But I'm going to cap off this year with a particularly ambitious multi-part story by none other than H.P. Lovecraft. So join us in this celebration as we give the old season a proper send-off and make way for the new. Anywho, that is all. Good night. Sleep tight. Pray the dark doesn't consume your light. And when the shadows begin to spill through the seams, I'll wish you all adieu. And of course, pleasant dreams. <laughs> the Mad Catter presents Twisted Tea Time is copyright 2017 by Z.P. Gowdy. All stories are the properties of their respective authors and are obtained via direct permission, creative commons, or they are quite simply public domain. Twisted Tea Time is executively produced for RenegadeRadio.com by Charlie Renegade. You can listen to Twisted Tea Time on RenegadeRadio.com Saturday nights at 9 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Music for Twisted Tea Time is used courtesy of Kevin McLeod and Incompetech.com. Jason White at www.soundcloud.com forward slash angels dash of dash despair and Mew at www.soundcloud.com forward slash Mew M-Y-U-U This episode's podcast shout-out was Edict Zero F-I-S which can be found at www.edictzero.wordpress.com Music for Edict Zero, FIS promo, was the Harvey Mix remix of 26 Ghosts 3 by Nine Inch Nails, available in the extras section of the Edict Zero website. 
If you want to support this show and help us grow, then leave a review or rating on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or wherever you get your podcast goodies. Or you can go to www.patreon.com forward slash the mad catter and sign up for a low cost monthly subscription to get bonus goodies. For more of me and my mischief, find my charming grin on facebook.com forward slash Cheshire Hats or on Twitter at Real Mad Catter. You can also download past episodes from SoundCloud at www.soundcloud.com forward slash Cheshire Hats. Good night, kitties. And sweet dreams.